everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'm guessing you can uh, guess from that welcome that there's quite a lot of Sky people in the audience. Um, it's really great to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me to talk. Um, way back when, I did a degree in language and communication. Uh, it's always completely fascinated me about how language uh, and, the, and the power that language has, the way people can use exactly the same words uh, and mean two completely different things. And because they're using the same words, there's this expectation that they mean the same thing and that they have the same understanding about what it is that they're talking about and that they leave the conversation thinking that they've agreed to something, ready to action, whatever that is. Uh, and actually, they have meant, they've taken away two completely different ideas from the conversation. After I finished my degree, uh, I moved to New York, which was uh, pretty special. Um, and that was two, you know, the, the old adage is, is very true. It's two completely, uh, two groups of people separated by that completely uh, common language. Um, and it was, it was everywhere. It was in everything that I did. It was uh, the times that I had to order water in Spanish because nobody could understand the way that I pronounced the word water. Um, <laughs> it was in that really kind of hesitant way that I would phrase some of my sentences. You know, it was just so, so typically British. Um, that way that my accent seemed to give me just that little bit more authority in a meeting, um, and I'm pretty sure is the reason that I was given the job in the first place. Um, and it's been 20 years now since I met my American husband, and we still frequently miscommunicate with each other because of words that we use. I uh, just a couple of weeks ago told him that I was going to mooch around the shops, uh, which he thought meant I was going to go out and steal a whole load of things. Uh, <laughs> Who knew that mooch meant something totally different in America? And actually, I've just seen a shop called Mooch down the street from here, which is, uh, so it's clearly not just me. Um, you know, look, none of this is new. Nothing that I'm saying here is new. People have been studying language and the way we communicate with each other for a really, really long time. But there's something really interesting when it's words in the workplace. Um, it has such a huge impact on our success. Done right, teams will prosper, There'll be uh, the projects will be easier, problems will be identified, and they'll be resolved faster, and uh, quite frankly, everything will just be that little bit more fun to do. Done badly, and life is much, much harder. When I moved back to the UK, I worked first at Vodafone for a little while, and then I went to Sky, uh, and I had a couple of breaks in between to have kids, but basically, I've been at Sky ever since, which is quite a long time now. Um, and I've worked on everything. I've worked on the apps for Sky Plus and Sky Go. I've worked on the TV products for Sky Q and Sky Glass. And now I'm back to apps again, looking after now uh, Sky Sports and Sky News. So working client side for that long has given me the opportunity to work with like, a lot of different product teams. And they each have their own unique ways of working. They have their own personalities, their own problems, their own opportunities, right? Because nothing's a weakness anymore. They're always opportunities. Um, and I've seen like numerous times, so many times, the way that the relationship between designers and product managers can be quite fraught sometimes because we think we want different things. We can think that we're coming at it from different perspectives. And I've been witness to teams really succeeding or failing at building those great products simply because of the way that they talk to each other. And ultimately, that's what it's all about, right? That's why we show up to work each day to get great products out to our customers, uh, into their hands, and to like, materially make a difference in their lives, whether that is really big, like saving somebody uh, from A&E, or really small, you know, like making it easier for them to uh, watch a great piece of content. Um, so what I wanted to share with you today and talk to you about is examples of where I've seen this work and where it hasn't, um, and what I've done when I've spotted those issues. So you can hopefully take these learnings away with you and start to build or hopefully maintain, if you're already doing it, um, really great relationships with your product owners. 
So, first of all, what I'll cover and what I won't. I'm a really true believer in that three-legged stool of design, development, and product. Um, it underpins the way that I approach all of the products that I look after and the way that I encourage the teams to look after it as well. Um, the theory, obviously, doesn't always quite work like that in, uh, in real life. But rather than focus today on the collaboration between all three of those legs, uh, today I'm going to share four stories um, about the relationship between product and design. So not that, that the relationship between all three of those isn't important and the relationship between design and development isn't important. I'm far from it. Um, but it's a whole different set of challenges. And I think it would take me at least another 20 minutes to, to talk through those. Um, so, while well, we're talking about the uh, product trio, story number one, uh, in early 2021, um, I started a new role as the creative director for Now. Uh, so Now is a Sky business. For those of you that don't know, it's, um, it's Sky content that you can uh, take without a subscription um, or without a, a long subscription. Um, but basically, it's, it's on the same campus, right? It's the same, it's the same stuff. It's all in the same place. It's the same people. It's the same back-end services. Uh, lots of people move between the two uh, areas of the business, right? So it felt like a pretty easy move to just move from one building to another. That didn't feel like it was going to be that difficult. Um, especially, you know, I've been around Sky for a while. I know the language of it. I know all the weird acronyms. I know lots of the people. I felt like I could kind of talk like a local. Um, so in one of the first meetings that I went into, uh, the management team were discussing this new way that they had come up with of working together. Uh, and they were calling it a three-legged stool. And I was like, this is amazing. You know, I'm already going into this meeting. Everybody kind of wants to... Uh, work in the same way that I do, they're going to talk the same way that I do, that's brilliant. Uh, you know, I'll be pushing on a completely open door. So this slide came up in the meeting, uh, it had three legs of a stool on it, it had product, it had development, and it had delivery. <laughs> uh, I thought, uh, Okay, maybe not quite so uh, open door, maybe just like a little crack that I needed to open a bit wider. Um, now, clearly, the delivery function at any organization is really important, but it's a support function, right? It's there to make sure that those three legs of that stool don't get wobbly uh, and that, you know, everyone works well together and everyone sort of knows what they're doing. But without design, there's no product. There's nothing to deliver. And it's those really healthy tensions between product and design and development that mean we get our, the best products out to our customers. Uh, so I piped up, <laughs> stuck my hand up, uh, and it you know, kind of explained that a traditional product trio would include design, because you're never really sure when you're in these meetings quite what level of uh, knowledge everybody has in those meetings. Um, and it explains that the optics of having a design team within product, which was effectively what they were insinuating from this slide, was not that there wasn't design, but that actually it was within product. But the, the optics of that are that design are quite often seen as being art workers, right? They're there to sort of color in the ideas after somebody else has come up with them which is not where we want to be at all and not where we're best placed to be and not where we can be of the most use. Um, so I explained that you know, we needed to be involved in idea generation right from the very beginning. And you know, nobody in that room disagreed with what I was saying. They just hadn't really thought through what that meant when they put it up a slide like this and you know, what the impact was of presenting it that way. So, you know, things didn't change immediately after that meeting. I needed to be the squeaky wheel. So I needed to pipe up every time I could see that people were sort of falling back into this, uh, into their old habits. And to do that, you know, I was really annoying. I was really, really repetitive. And every time there was a meeting that came up, I inserted us into it. And every time a meeting was set up, I would you know, say, is somebody from design in that meeting? And 
yeah, they would uh, sort of roll their eyes and put somebody from design in that meeting. And, but, you know, after a while, either they realized what a good idea that was, or they were just really bored of hearing me talk. Uh, but, you know, they put design into the meeting, and, yeah, definitely, uh, it definitely had uh, a great outcome. So we were able to help create um, and document a new discovery process alongside the product team. And we co-created it, which made sure that we had a process that both teams had signed up to. Um, and therefore, it felt like it covered all of our needs. So when, when we started new projects, we had more ownership of the decisions. We had more empowerment to call things out at an earlier stage of the project. But nothing's ever perfect in life. So an additional lesson I learned was that, you know, sound as your logic might be, and as violently as everybody in that room agreed with what I was saying, it's not always easy to make changes exactly the way you want them to happen. So everyone in that room, without a doubt, agreed that design should be a leg of the stool, but they weren't completely on board with delivery, with the idea that that delivery was a support function. So now, at now, we have what is <laughs> fondly referred to as a four-legged chair, uh, as opposed to a three-legged stool, but, you know, we, uh, the outcome, we got the outcome that we wanted, and that's fine. We compromised, and now we just all talk about the uh, four-legged chair. Uh, so story number two, another meeting. There's lots of meetings, let's go. Uh, this one was to kick off what, the, what a product should look like in a couple of years' time um, and what the vision would be. Now, vision, I feel, is a really good example of a word that means so many different things to different people. And it can be a really triggering word, right, because we all spend lots of time uh, putting, uh, you know, lots of time and effort into our ideas. And talking about a vision can kind of bring back all those memories of, like, ideas that have either been de-scoped or they've been put to the bottom of a backlog or they've, you know, they're gathering dust somewhere. Um, but without a vision, it's, it's very easy for everybody to sort of go off in their own directions and, you know, nobody really knows what, what that North Star is and, and where they're heading towards. Um, so the trick is to find that sort of middle ground where the ideas don't feel like so far away that they're just totally fanciful and aren't ever going to happen. But they're not so near-term that, you know, everybody's already thought of them, uh, and you just, it's just, it sort of feels like the next iteration rather than actually doing something really transformational. So a particular issue in this meeting was the practicalities of how to make this vision project work. Like on the one hand was how to find the time to come up with these new ideas, and on the other hand was the feeling that like, these, or, these ideas already existed, so what was the point of doing all of this vision work all over again? So what should have been quite a quick meeting turned into a, you know, at least 90 minutes of talking about semantics, basically. Like, what did vision mean? What did we mean when we said the work had already been done? Like, where was the work? Why didn't everybody already know that the work had been done? Whose responsibility was it to come up with the vision? Was it the people doing the day-to-day -day work, or was it a separate team that you needed to put in place? And after an awful lot of discussion, uh, which was, is really necessary, you know, this isn't saying that we shouldn't be talking about any of this stuff. We need to hear everybody's ideas and everybody's thoughts on this. I realized that actually it was our language getting in the way of us progressing. It felt like we were all saying the same thing and we were actually agreeing with each other. But the words we were using made it sound like we were challenging each other. And what we wanted was all of the answers to those questions up front, right? We sort of wanted to know the answers so that we could then feel like it was perfect and it was okay, and then once we had the answers to these questions, we could then move on and start. But, yeah, we're never going to have all the, all the answers. So, in the sort of dying embers of the meeting, we decided that actually we just needed to make a start um, and that the questions would sort of work themselves out as we went. And then in the following meetings, we were really careful to use language that clearly explained what we were doing. We did regular show and tell so that nobody felt excluded from that. And the most important thing 
was that we agreed to continuously check in and check back in on the way that things were going. So if something wasn't working, then that was perfectly okay. Not every project is going to, to be perfect. But what's important is creating that space where people feel comfortable to call out when things aren't going quite the right way and give them the opportunity to find a different way. We can use our language and the way we all work together to create that safety net, which then ultimately, once you feel safe, back to the psychological safety idea, once you feel safe, you've got this um, ability to be able to do your best work. And the third story. So a discussion I had uh, recently around some of the billing journeys on now. Um, now, for any of you that work on billing journeys, they're really difficult, right? They're really complex, uh, and lots of people have got lots of opinions on them because they affect the bottom line. Um, and you know, now it's particularly complex because we have billing journeys that, that have to work across all sorts of different platforms. Some are direct billing, some are direct uh, onto the apps, and it's, it's a really complicated world. Um, and we were talking about a proposition change, a, pro a change in the way that we would sell now to our customers. And an initial deck had been put together by some product people, and we, they showed us the deck, and it was ready for some senior execs to kind of you know, push it all the way up and figure out what we wanted to do with it. It was, I don't know, like 100 slides long, and almost every one of those slides had so many words on it. Um, and actually, what we had been asked to do was come in, to come in was to provide some kind of indicative wireframes to show how that might work. Uh, these images are not that, because it's all way too confidential to be able to put up here, but you know, these kind of illustrate the point. By drawing a few rough wireframes, even at that senior, senior exec level, rough, rough wireframes were what we needed to be able to really quickly cut through some of that complex discussion. And importantly, it also reduces that ambiguity between everyone's understanding of what all of those words mean. Because if you're in a meeting with a whole lot of execs and you've got that many words up on a slide, everybody's going to take a slightly different thing away from the meeting about that. So by showing exactly which pages of the product we were talking about and what the changes would be, it meant that everyone could leave that meeting with the same understanding about the trade-offs of making one decision over another. It didn't necessarily make that decision any easier. There are still many more meetings to go through and many more things to decide. But we at least were aligned and we had communicated the same ideas. So one other thing to note about this is that how design were brought in at a really early stage in the discussion. So yes, it was to help illustrate the issues, you know, it's our kind of bread and butter, but also it was to work through whether we had any red lines up front, whether there were any options that would just make it too hard to get a user through the buying journey. So our expertise was recognized and it was sought after, and that's all because we are one of those four legs of a chair. So one last story for you, and it's about us adapting to others and us needing to learn the new language. As designers, we have a bewildering set of words to describe what we're doing that may not always translate outside of our industry. And we do our best to educate our counterparts on what each of these mean, but it should also work the other way around. We have a process in now called QPP. I feel like there's a whole bunch of designers in the front row like beginning to shake. Uh, and it stands for quarterly planning process. Uh, and it's what we use to determine what should be built in the next quarter. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you, things like this make my designer heart die a little inside. Uh, it's not why I got into the design business in the first place, to look at spreadsheets and rank priorities and figure out whether one feature is more important than another. But QPP has given us a way better understanding of how much can be done in a quarter. We know more about when we need to get things ready for, there's less last minute surprises. And as part of QPP, 
our deliverables need to be ready for something called N0 and N minus one. Like you can see those at the top of that slide there. Like, and to be totally honest with you, I can't even remember why they're called N0 and N minus one, but the, the thing is it, doesn't, it really doesn't matter. What matters is that all the designers know what it means for them. When they need to get files to the technical analysts, what level of fidelity those should be at, whether it needs to be something for estimation or something for the uh, devs to start building. And I really find it hard to overestimate the number of meetings we used to have when this process wasn't in place. And there'd be lots of us in a room and somebody would say, why isn't this done? And somebody would say, well, I was expecting to build it and actually this is too high level and I don't know what I'm doing. And it saved us an incredible amount of time having this process. And the relationships are just better all around. Yes, and it means us talking a different language that is completely foreign to us, but you know, the, the, uh, the outcomes have definitely been worth it. I don't think anything that I have told you here is earth shattering. Right? I'm sure all of you instinctively know and recognize the things that I've talked about, but it's precisely because they are known and, and that they seem easy that's precisely the reason that we need to concentrate on them. All too often in you know, stressful situations when something goes wrong, we think we have to make a kind of huge shift and leap in the way that we've been working and you know, change everything. And actually, by going back to the basics and just repeating them, we create this consistency and we create these expected behaviors. And that in turn then opens up the communication between teams and provides that foundation for all of us, again, to be able to do our best work. So my next challenge uh, is to do the same thing and improve the relationship between design and development. Uh, maybe next year I will come back and tell you, how, tell you all how that has gone. And one last thing to leave you with, if you uh, want to come and benefit from all those brilliant relationships that we now have with our product team uh, and work on some really fantastic products. Obviously, they're uh, amazing products, uh, which go out to millions and millions of people. Uh, you can come talk to me. You can come talk to one of the lovely Sky team that can all wave and, you know, show they're all down at the front somewhere. Uh, there's teams in Leeds, there's teams in London. Um, so, yeah, come, uh, come talk to us. Thank you.